It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Sarah Ahmed, a renowned feminist scholar whose work philosophically interrogates intersectional questions of gender studies, critical race theory, queer theory, power, and post-colonialism. Sarah is a prolific writer, having authored 10 books and edited another eight books and journals, work connected through its grounding in feminist, queer, and anti-racist politics. Her books include 2019's What's the Use? On the Uses of Use, where she considers utilitarianism and the potentiality of queer use, 2017's Living a Feminist Life, where she builds on feminist of color scholarship to show how feminist theory is generated from everyday life, and 2014's Willful Subjects, where she interrogates relations between the will and willfulness. In her writings, she uses the tools of feminist theory to analyze mechanisms of oppression and discrimination in everyday life, as well as in institutional contexts. Her blog, feministkilljoys.com, is an essential critical resource and features scores of brilliantly crafted essays concerned, to quote Sarah, with how bodies and worlds take shape and how power is secured and challenged in everyday life and in institutional cultures. Dr. Ahmed's latest book, Complaint, due out in September, concerns the mechanics, technology, compulsions and costs of complaint, specifically by marginalized persons in institutionalized settings. In this evening's talk, Dr. Ahmed offers a critical reflection on the role of complaint within inclusion and diversity policies related to educational and cultural institutions, bringing together stories about making complaints by academics and students of color to show how universities remain hostile environments despite or even through official policies on diversity and inclusion. This work draws out many of the challenges which we are currently facing in Ireland in terms of reassessing our cultural institutions, as well as legacies of violence against vulnerable persons and responses to complaint. In the last year, complaint has featured heavily in our national narratives, whether regarding racism, following the death of George Floyd and the rise of the Irish Black Lives Matter movement, or more generalized forms of institutional abuse following the publication of the final report of the Commission of Investigation into Mother and Baby Homes. Yet one is reminded that these same complaints have been made many times over since the foundation of the state. As John Brannigan and others note, in the 1940s, racism led to black people in Ireland being excluded from accommodation and employment, as well as subject to hate crimes. Testimonies of racial harassment and violence reported to government were dismissed as paranoia. At the same time as Kaylin Hogan and others have outlined, reports regarding systemic institutional abuse were submitted and filed away. Just as notions of cultural homogeneity placed people of color, travelers, single mothers, LGBTQ communities and others outside the parameters of Irish identity, so complaint was positioned as antagonism and embedded prejudices were obfuscated. In discussing imperial practices, Sara refers to container technology, how power is maintained through the restriction of the circulation of knowledge about those deemed other, so that knowledge becomes a system of references in which the others are the object, not subjects, spoken about, not, not spoken to. Coming back to our own context, there has been much discussion of late of what Galen Hogan calls the industrial shame complex, whereby victims of historic institutional abuse were stigmatized and silenced through shame. As we forge new paths towards a more inclusive society, Complaint has become weaponized once more through the political balance of victimhood, as symbols of hegemony adopt what Lily Shuliaraki calls the master signifier of victimhood, subverting discourses of power and violence through the neoliberal lens. Calls to acknowledge colonial histories in Ireland and to decolonize or de-neocolonize the syllabus are gaining ground, but we still lack a national action plan against racism, and we still hear many of the same re narratives regarding complaints affirming the facts while denying the moral import. While it is welcome that the government has just announced a four-year plan to end direct provision, for example, pointing to issues raised by Brian Fanning 20 years ago, insights rejected by the government of the time as flawed research, the direct provision system references a historic legacy of institutionalization as a mechanism for protecting the narrow definition of Irishness as white, middle-class, heterosexual, ableist, and Catholic. In a piece for the Dublin Enquirer, Teresa Bushkowska writes that last, year's, last June's parliamentary discussion on racism arguably perpetuated the system of racial, racial marginalization. 
due to the lack of migrant, traveler and minority ethnic people involved in that discussion, meaning that the agency of those directly affected by racism and discrimination was removed. Similar arguments have been made about the nascent institutional interest in black studies, critical race studies, Asian and Afro-Caribbean studies. Even as there are attempts to break open and unravel container technology, its imperial underpinnings continue to resist meaningful reform, exposing the challenges of trying to overcome discrimination in a system which is structurally discriminatory. Meanwhile, the coronavirus pandemic has illuminated the entrenchment of social divisions through its disproportionate impacts on Black and Asian people, people living in poverty, and people with disabilities. In this climate, Sarah's complaint project becomes more pertinent than ever. While drawing on the testimonies of those who have gone through the university complaints process, her work speaks to our need to transform our understanding of complaint and the complainant. Her findings illuminate the conditions of social membership and the immovability of certain ideologies. And yet her analysis provides hope through models for how we might find ways to push through systems resistance complaints in order to achieve lasting structural change and to become agents of that change, given that, as Sarah notes, not only is the personal political, the structural is also personal. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Ahmed with her lecture on complaints, diversity, and other hostile environments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoli, for your very thoughtful and wise introduction. And I, I love how you introduce us to the work and the significance of the work here in Ireland. I'm so pleased to share this event with you. And thanks also to Sophie for the work that you put into making this event possible. I was supposed to give a lecture for Emma in Dublin in March 2020, and then again, um, February of this year. And I think we all know too well the reasons why neither of those was possible. So I'm very glad it is possible to give this lecture online. To all of you who are listening, wherever you are, I really appreciate the time and the attention that you're giving us. I would like to dedicate this lecture to everyone who shared their experiences of complaint with me. Your wisdom and insight are just so precious and I have learned so much from you all. So this is for you, our army of complainers. So I'm just going to share my screen. I am still relatively new to Zoom. This is my second lecture. So hopefully it was gonna work. Okay. So I'll be sharing with you today stories of making complaints at universities that have been shared with me. Let me start with a story. I'm speaking to a woman of colour academic. She has set up a writing group in her department because she wanted to create a more collaborative research culture. But the meetings quickly became dominated by senior men. What I found in each of the meetings were senior men who were bullying everyone in the room. The bullying took the form of the constant belittling of the work of more junior academics, as well as postgraduate students. The first session, someone was just being really abusive about someone's PhD, saying it was rubbish. Racist comments are made. I'm from London and London is just ripe for ethnic cleansing. She described how people laughed and how the laughter filled the room. She comments on these comments. These were the sorts of things being aired. These were the sorts of things, sentences as sentencing, violence thrown out as how some are thrown out. Even the air can be occupied, history as stale air. So what to do, what do you do? She decided to make a complaint because she wanted it recorded and because the culture was being reproduced for new PhD students. So a complaint becomes a recording device. You have to record what you do not want to reproduce. She gathers statements from around 20 people in her department. So a complaint can be a collective. A meeting is set up in response to the complaint. And at that meeting, she is described by the head of human resources as having a chip on her shoulder, as if she suffers from a personal grudge. She adds, they treated the submission as an act of arrogance on my part. It is as if she put the complaint forward as a way of putting herself forward. Her complaint goes nowhere and the issues are in her terms swept under the carpet. So when those who try to stop a culture from being reproduced 
are stopped, a culture is being reproduced. So when you complain about how spaces are occupied, you learn how spaces remain occupied. That occupation can be a lesson teaches us that it's not always obvious that it is achieved or indeed how it is achieved. Sometimes an unexpected arrival into a space can allow us to see more clearly who or what a space is intended for. In my book, What's the Use? I use this image as an image of queer use, how spaces can be used in ways that were not intended or by those for whom they were not intended. So the birds turn a post box into a nest. Of course, the post box can only become a nest if it stops being used as a post box, hence the sign, please don't use address to would be posters of letters. I think of these birds rather affectionately as our queer kin. They turned a small opening intended for letters into a door, a queer door perhaps, a way of getting in and out of the box. I'm aware this is a rather happy and hopeful image, perhaps not a typical one for a feminist killjoy. It is in fact rare that we can just turn up and turn a box into a nest or a room into a shelter to queer use to enable some to take up residence in spaces not intended for them usually requires a world dismantling effort. So complaint describes some of that effort. By complaint, I'm not just referring here to formal complaints. Return to the experiences of the one of color academic, although she understood her own action as complaint, it was not received as such, which meant that a formal complaint process was not triggered. When I was listening to her testimony, her description of the work she had to do as a woman of color academic in a white patriarchal institution, I realized that to tell the story of a complaint can be to tell a life story. All the incidences, so many incidences, the times you said something, called it out, the times you didn't, the struggles you had that led you to complain, the struggles you had because you complained. So the narrowing of the complaint as a genre, a complaint as a requirement to fill in a form in a certain way at a certain time can be how many of these struggles are not recorded. So although I began this project as a project on formal complaints, I realized very early on that to keep that focus would be to miss too much. So since June, 2017, I have been gathering oral and written testimonies by students and academics about the experiences that led them to complain and experiences of complaint, whether those complaints were made formally or not. My project in being on complaints made at the university is also on the university. And by on the university, I do not just mean the university is my research site, or, or, although it is that. I also mean that my project is about the work of trying to transform universities. I'm deeply indebted to critiques of diversity and the university offered by black feminists and feminists of color, especially such as Jackie Alexander, Surma Bilger, Heidi Merzer, Chandra Tape Mahanti, Melinda Smith, Shirley Ann Tate, and Gloria Becker. So their combined work has created what I think of as a counter institutional archive, teaching us how universities work, for whom they work. So in this lecture, I hope to add to that archive by sharing stories about complaint from Black, Indigenous and of colour academics and students. I need you to know that these stories include details of assault as well as harassment, as well as bullying. These are uh, difficult stories to share and I'm aware that they may be difficult to hear. So please do take care of yourselves in listening to them. So if to tell a story of a complaint can be to tell a life story, to tell a story of a complaint can also be to tell another story of the institution. And that story often counters the institution's story, including the institution's story it tends to tell of itself. On paper, this is the institutional story, a complaint can be pictured as a flowchart 
with clear arrows and lines that give the would-be complainer a route through. Things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they appear on paper. I look at this picture of a complaints procedure and I see diversity. Diversity is papering over the cracks. Diversity as smoothing out of an appearance. So if the institutional story of a complaint is often told as a flow chart, flow, flow, away we go, the institutional story of diversity is often told as an open door. One university took this telling rather literally and transformed the open door of diversity, we can call that door, the diversity door, into a project of attaching photographs of black and ethnic minority students and staff to door panels across the campus. So here the vice chancellor is figured as holding the door open and BME students and staff are pictured not even as going through the door, but as being on the door. The diversity door is most often used to indicate a kind of welcome turned into a tagline, tag on, tag along, minorities welcome, come in, come in. Just because they welcome you, it doesn't mean they expect you to turn up. Or you might turn up and open the diversity door only to find a hostile environment. The woman of color whose testimony I opened with described her department, which she has since left, as a revolving door. Women and minorities in her terms enter, only to head right out again, whoosh, whoosh. You might be kept out, you might get out, because of what you find out when you get in, or getting in can be how you're shown this side out. So why use the term hostile environment? Many harassment policies use this term to describe the creation of a work culture that is undermining or degrading to a person or persons. In the UK, the term hostile environment has since been used by government as the name of a policy on illegal immigration. The use of a term that was already definitional of workplace harassment for a policy teaches us that harassment became a policy, indeed a national policy. The category of illegal immigrant is itself a racializing category. You can be brown or black and born here and be told to go back or to go home. Yes, that was a message sent out on a ban. In other words, racial harassment as national policy, the right to interrogate those who appear not from here. A hostile environment is not always, however, an official policy. In fact, most organizations have policies against workplace harassment. So when cases of harassment are leaked into the public domain, many organizations point to these policies as if having policies against something is evidence it does not exist. But policies can exist without being used. One woman of color academic describes, that was my experience of the complaint process. As an employer of the university, the minute you try to enact policy, it is a tripwire, <laughs> something like that. The policies are not meant. So you'll stop from using a policy to do what it's supposed to do, rather like a trespasser, is stopped from entering the building. So a policy can be a door that appears open, but is shut because of what you're trying to do or because of who is trying to enter. Doors matter. Doors are not just physical things that swing on hinges, though they are that. They are also mechanisms that enable an opening or a closing. So when a path is no longer available to us, a door becomes a figure of speech, we say, that door is closed. Doors can be, to borrow from Audre Lorde, the master's tools, teaching us how the same house is being built, how some, only some can enter, how others become trespassers. So who holds the door to the institution? Who holds the diversity door? A diversity door can open onto a house in the sense that behind that door, you might find some resources. Another woman of color academic describes how her research expertise was used to secure funding for a project that was, if you like, diversity related. When the project is funded, she is shut out. She describes, if you are a mascot, you are silent. Everything you are amounts to nothing. You are stuffing, if that. 
a skeleton with stuffing. I was kicked out of the frame of the management structure. I had no control over how the money was spent, who was being employed, who was being invited to be on the advisory board. A scholar who has the expertise, the knowledge, also provides the color, is useful. So the project directors open the diversity door to get the money, only to shut that door when they get the money. And to shut that door is to shut her out, to silence her, to shut her up even. One of the directors of this project is not just a senior white woman, although she is that, she's also a direct descendant of colonizers. She's high colonial British Raj. Her grandmother's gravestone is in Calcutta and that's rare. You have to be really high up in the British Raj. Let me summarize her experience as a finding. The colonizer wins the diversity award. They hold the door, which is how they can open it long enough to access the knowledge also being of those who enter only to shut it again. So they do not enter the diversity door, they hold it. So that diversity door might be the same door that is shut on a complaint. A postdoctoral researcher, a woman of color, wants to make a complaint about racial discrimination, but she was hired as part of a diversity program and she knows that the program is precarious. I don't want to do something that is going to threaten a program that is supposed to diversify the faculty. So she was worried that making a complaint because of what she herself had experienced would threaten a program that was itself about opening the door for other people of color who were to come. She uses the term coercive diversity for how the university wanted to make use of her body and her research as evidence of its diversity whilst undermining her work as a colleague, as an early career academic, indeed, as a human being. She describes the work. What is the work of the complaint? It is labor. It is the work of diversity. It is not paid, it is punished. It is like chipping away at the foundations of white supremacy. I'm trying to chip away at it with my fingernails. The foundations you chip away at with your fingernails, the foundations of white supremacy, something like that, stay up, seemingly unaffected by all that work. And it's your own nails, your body, yourself, that ends up being chipped and weathered and worn. I think back to how a diversity practitioner once described her work to me as a banging your head against the brick wall job. I think she hit the nail on the head with that description. If the wall keeps its place, it is you that gets sore. And what happens to the wall? All you seem to have done is scratch the surface. And this is what the work of diversity and the work of complaint often feel like, scratching at the surface, scratching at the surface. So scratching gives you a sense of the limits of what you can accomplish. I suggested earlier that complaint can be the effort to take up residence in spaces that are not built for us. Some might have to complain before they can even enter the room, you might not be able to get to the door, let alone get through the door. So an academic has to keep pointing out that the rooms are inaccessible because they keep booking rooms that are inaccessible. She has to keep saying it because they keep doing it. I worry about drawing attention to myself, but this is what happens when you hire a person in a wheelchair. There have been major access issues at the university. She speaks of the drain, the exhaustion, the sense of why should I have to be the one who speaks out? You have to speak out because others do not. And because you speak out, others can justify their own silence, they hear you. So it becomes about you. Major access issues become your issues. Structures are often treated as issues made personal. If you keep having a problem, the problem is you. If you have these issues, you often end up on the diversity committee. She identifies as biracial, she's a lesbian as well as being disabled. The more issues you have, the more committees you end up on. She sort of talked to me about how in a previous post, she'd been hired to bring in diversity. Yes, so often diversity is assumed to come in when we do. She said, I was brought in to assist with some cultural change to bring in diversity and a progressive curriculum. 
But when an organization appoints someone to assist with some cultural change, it does not mean that those within the organization are actually willing to be assisted, she describes. I found being the only woman in a senior management group quite a distressing experience. I found there were lots of sexualized conversations. I felt like I was in a latrine. They were really over the top inappropriate. There were also racialized conversations. They always referred to the black boy. The Dean works in critical jurisprudence. He's a real high flyer and crash hard about feminist stuff, feminist politics and scholarship. He had a double kind of life. I thought someone from a diverse background would actually make a difference, which is why I took up that position. I was the most senior person with a visible disability in the university. You find a gap, you mind a gap. A gap between an appearance of being committed to diversity and equality and the kinds of conversations that have become routine. A gap between having a manager who is hot about feminist stuff and the conduct of that manager. You come to realize that hiring someone from a diverse background does not make a difference, that your arrival does not make a difference, even though they can and do use your arrival as a sign of having made a difference. Perhaps diversity is itself a double life. A gap between how things appear and what keeps happening can be a gap that you fall through. I think back to the post box that has become a nest. There could have been another sign on that post box, birds welcome. Diversity is that sign. The sign would be a non-performative, empty of force if the post box was still in use because the birds would be dislodged by the letters, a nest destroyed before it could be created. All those sexualized conversations, all those racialized conversations, they function as letters in the box. They pile up until there's no room left, no room to, br to breathe, to nest or to be. It is not enough to open a door or to appear welcoming. For some to be in the room requires stopping what usually happens in that room. Otherwise they would be, as it were, displaced by the letters in the box. Even spaces set up to challenge how universities are occupied can end up being occupied in the same old ways. Another one of color academic describes, I was on the equality and diversity group in the university. And as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed a the portfolio of who could be on the committee and I was dropped. So certain words can carry a complaint. You just have to say a word like race and you'll be heard as complaining. Another time she is writing a paper for a special issue of a journal on decolonizing her discipline. She receives feedback from a white editor. The response of the editor was, needs to be toned down, not enough scholarly input to back up the claims they are making. Basically, get back in your box. And if you want to decolonize, we'll do it on our terms. Being dropped from the diversity committee for mentioning things to do with race is continuous were being told to tone it down on the decolonizing special issue. You turn up and you're told, hey, this is not your box. Get back into your own box. Remember those letters? You end up being displaced. So whiteness can be just as occupying of issues or spaces when they're designated decolonial. I sometimes call this decolonial whiteness. So what happens if you raise issues on these issues? She describes, Whenever you raise something, the response is, you're not one of them. A complaint then seems to amplify what makes you not fit picking up on what you, not, you are not. A complainer becomes a stranger, a trespasser, a complaint, a confirmation that you're not from here, not really from here, not. And then you stand out, you become the person to be interrogated. Another woman of color academic filed a complaint about academic misconduct against a postgraduate student who plagiarizes her work. This student is supervised by a senior white man in her department. So she receives a report from the interrogation committee and she asks a friend who was a legal expert to read it. She came back and she said, you know how it goes in rape trials, don't you? And I said, yes. And she said, this letter is asking you questions on the grounds of why you should have not been penetrated. You basically have to defend why you should not have had this happen to you despite all the evidence. It's a painful connection to make 
between what happens in a rape trial and what happens in an academic misconduct case. Pain can be that connection. When a woman of colour's work is stolen, she is made responsible for that theft as if she caused it to happen, as if she invited it. Consider that ideas are often assumed to originate with some people, ideas as becoming seminal, ideas as passed down a line from a man professor, white man professor, to his student. In claiming misconduct against a white man professor student, she crossed that line. Perhaps it's inexplicable to the professor and to those who fall into line that a woman of colour has ideas that will be deemed worth taking. Perhaps if she has ideas, these ideas are judged as not really her own ideas or even not really ideas. Her work just becomes unmediated data there for the taking. And then when she claims her ideas have been taken, she's questioned as if there's something wrong with her claim. When some people complain about being wronged, interrogation is made a right. A trans student of colour makes a complaint about sexual harassment and transphobic harassment from their supervisor who kept asking them deeply intrusive questions about their gender and genitals. Questions can be hammering for some to be, is to be in question. These questions were laced in the language of concern for the welfare of the student, predicated on judgments that they would be endangered if they conducted their research in their home country. Racist judgments are often about the location of danger over there in a black or brown elsewhere. Transphobic judgments are often about the location of danger in here, in the body of a trans person as if to be trans is to incite the violence against you over there in here. For trans people of color, the point of intersectionality can be everywhere. When they complain, what happens? People were just trying to evaluate whether he was right to believe there would be some sort of physical danger to me because of my gender identity, as if to say he was right to be concerned. The same questions that led you to complain are asked because you complain. And these questions make the concern right, or even into a right, a right to be concerned. So much harassment today is enacted as a right to be concerned. We have a right to be concerned about immigration as citizens. We have a right to be concerned about sex-based rights as adult human females and so on. A right to be concerned is how violence is enacted, a violence premised on suspicion that some are not who they say they are, that some have no right to be where they are, that some have no right to be. So a complaint can bring out what the complaint is about. An Indigenous student made a complaint about white supremacy in her class, she describes. You start seeing these patterns and I wanted to start questioning them, you know, white supremacy in the classroom, white privilege in the classroom that's not being called out or tackled, constructions of Indigenous people in the classroom that are very colonial. You call it out because others do not. So how, how does she do that? She sends a letter to the professor. And what does the professor do? I told him what the issues were. I said I wouldn't be able to come back into the classroom until these matters were addressed. And he never responded to me. He never responded to me, but I got a phone call the next day from one of the women on the call. She said, the professor came to class today and he read out the email you wrote about us. He read out the email. So rather than respond to her, the Indigenous student who called it out, the white professor prints out her letter and reads it out to the class, the same class she's complaining about without her permission. I think of what he is expressing in doing that. She is complaining about what is taken from her. White supremacy is a theft of that space. She cannot be in that space. And then her complaint is taken away from her, turned into just another way that he expresses himself. She does not return to the class. I think again of the post box, a classroom can be a post box. In writing that letter, she was trying to stop the same things from being posted, white supremacy as occupying of space. But the letter ends up being what is posted. So a complaint, about the letters in the box becomes another letter in the box. So all it takes is what usually happens to happen, 
for the person who complains to end up being displaced, which can feel like, because it is, being displaced by your own complaint. So if diversity is that sign, diversity also covers over the materiality of dispossession. Complaints about a hostile environment are made in a hostile environment. A Muslim student of colour does not get the same number of classes to teach that other students get or the same fellowships that other students get. She's an international student. She's also a mother. Not getting those classes, those fellowships, means she doesn't have enough to get by. So she lodges a complaint about racial discrimination. After I made a complaint against them, I felt all sorts of overt discrimination, as if the complaint made everyone free from the mask they used to put on when they were dealing with me before. Perhaps we could call that mask diversity. When the mask slips, the racism that is already there is given freer expression. So she decides to change programs, but she needs the support of the professors to get into another program and only two of the professors will give her a reference. She doesn't get into any other program. So she asks to see the references. She gets to see one. She sees why she does not get in. She wrote that I am good at transcribing data, nothing at all about my research, awards, a paper I was working with her on, nor about the classes I took with her. It was a short and a very weak letter. References can be doors, how some are stopped from progressing. The content of a weak reference matters. The reference says she's good at something. It says she is good at transcribing data. So those who embody diversity become data again. And in that becoming so much is gone, gone, gone the intellectual labor, gone the learning, gone the collaboration. So note here, power can work through what might seem like a very light touch. All you need to do to close the door is to write a less positive reference. And this means that the actions that close doors are not always perceptible to others. So it's not surprising that there are many door stories in these stories, because you're more likely to notice doors when they are shut in your face. In other words, we tend to notice what stops a progression. Even when doors are shut on us, stopping us from getting somewhere or stopping us from being somewhere, we might still have to work on ourselves to notice them. A postgraduate student is being harassed by her supervisor. She's a queer woman of colour. She's from a working class background. She's the first person in her family to go to university. She's had to fight really hard to get here. She's had to fight really hard to get here. I've repeated that sentence because of how it matters, because of how much it matters. Still, she knows something is not right. She's feeling more and more uncomfortable. He keeps pushing boundaries, wanting to meet off campus, then in coffee shops, then at his house. So she tries to handle the situation. I try very hard to keep all of the meetings on campus and to keep the door open. She keeps the door open an actual door, at the same time as she closes another kind of door, we might call this door the door of consciousness. She describes, I thought I would take myself down by admitting to the kind of violence he was enacting. Take myself down to admit to violence can feel like becoming your own killjoy, getting in the way of your own progression. So to admit can mean to confess a truth or to let something in. So doors can hold a contradiction. Keeping the office door open is an admission of a truth that she handles by not letting it in. But handles can stop working. I was sitting with another colleague at another lunch another day, he started texting me these naked photos of himself. And I think I just hit a critical mass of luck. I just can't handle it anymore. My friend I was sitting with, I just said, look at this. And she was just completely speechless. And then it suddenly started to seep into me, into her, in the shared conversation about how horrible and violent that I'm having to receive these things, right? And so that basically put a process in motion. We can't handle it anymore. The violence directed to her seeps in. And the violence seeps not only into her, but into her colleague, into the conversation, into the space in which they are having that conversation, when the violence gets in, the complaint comes out. 
A complaint is well described here as a critical mass. There is only so much violence you can take in before you just can't take it anymore. But what to do then? She goes to the office responsible for handling complaints. They were like, you can file a complaint, but he's really well loved by the university. He's a strong publication record. You're gonna go through all of this emotional torment. It was even proposed that he could counter sue me for defamation of character. The line was essentially, you can do this, but why would you? A warning is often what you receive when you indicate an intent to complain. A warning that to complain will have dire consequences, that to complain is to hurtle towards a miserable fate. And that warning here also takes form as a statement of what I would call institutional fatalism. Statements about what institutions are like, what they are as what they will be, who they love, who can reproduce an inheritance as who they will protect. So in the end, she does not file a formal complaint because she knew what she was being told, that she wouldn't get anywhere, that it wouldn't get anywhere because he was going somewhere. So the door shut on a complaint through all of these different actions, warnings, heeding a warning, can be the same door that is being kept open for the white man professor. That open door is not the diversity door. If it was to have any sign on it, it would probably say merit. People of colour are assumed to enter the diversity door. However, we enter the institution. And when we enter that door, we acquire debt as if we're dependent upon the door being opened. And that door can be shut at any point. Doors can be shut to stop you getting in. Doors can be shut because you get in. A black woman academic is being racially harassed and bullied by a white woman who is her head of department. I think what she wanted to do was to maintain a position as the director and I was supposed to be some pleb, you know what I mean? She had to be the boss and I had to be the servant type of thing. That was how her particular version of white supremacy worked. So not just belittling my academic credentials and academic capabilities, but also belittling me in front of the students, belittling me in front of administrators. How do you know it's about race? That's a question we often get asked. Racism is how we know it's about race. That wall, whiteness, or let's call it what it is as she has, white supremacy, we come to know it intimately as it's what keeps coming up. To have got there, a black woman in a white institution, a lecturer, senior lecturer on her way to becoming a professor, she is now a professor, is to be understood as having got above your station, above yourself, ahead of yourself, to belittle someone, to make them little can function as a command, be little. And that command is being sent not only to her, but to those who are deemed to share the status of being subordinates, to students, to administrators. So racial harassment can be the effort to restore a hierarchy. It is how someone is being told, you are not where you should be, you are above where you should be, or even you are where I should be, or even you have taken my place. She also said, when I told her I would like to work toward becoming a professor, she just laughed in my face. That laughter can be the sound of a door being slammed. Some of us in becoming professors become trespassers. You're being told you need permission to enter by being told you do not have permission. Perhaps some doors are shut by how they let some of us, some of us enter. A woman of color postgraduate wrote to me about abuse she experienced from her supervisor. Her supervisor was a star professor. Her supervisor was also another woman of color. This student admired her supervisor. She wanted to work with her, to learn from her, from her critiques of power. You can enact what you critique. Her abuse took the form of attacks on my still forming or imperfectly articulated thoughts, analyses and ideas in class. So the supervisor does not open the door for her student, another woman of color, but instead shuts it on her belittling her, criticizing her, making her feel smaller and wrong. And this supervisor, this professor does this while praising two white students in the class. They were the stars and darlings of the department, well awarded, published and conference, and didn't share my experiences at all. And they more or less minimized her behavior. Those who benefit from relationships with those who are abusive, often minimize the abuse to keep the benefits. 
is this what happens? Some of us become professors, even staff professors, singled out because we show we are willing to identify with the master, to love whom he would love, to target whom he would target. In other words, diversity can be a door deal. Doors might be open to some of us as long as we are willing to shut that door right behind us. To shut the door behind us is to shut the door on others. We don't even identify ourselves with the others. Sometimes in order not to shut the door on ourselves or on others, we might have to shut the door on the institution. I'm listening to an Indigenous woman academic. She told me she could barely get to campus after a sustained campaign of bullying and harassment from white faculty, including a concerted effort by a senior manager to sabotage her tenure case, as well as the tenure cases of other Indigenous academics. When you are harassed and bullied, when doors are closed and they slammed, making it hard to get anywhere, it can be history you are thrown up against, that you are up against. So complaints can take us back, back further and further still to histories that are still. There is a genealogy of experience, a genealogy of consciousness in my body that is now at this stage traumatized beyond the capacity to go to the university. So there's a legacy, a genealogy, and I haven't really opened that door too widely as I've been so focused on my own experience in the last seven years. To be traumatized is to hold a history in a body you can be easily shattered. There is only so much that you can take on because there's only so much that you can take in. Earlier, I used the expression, the door of consciousness to describe how we sometimes shut violence out, perhaps because it's too difficult to deal with, perhaps to hold onto something we fear losing, perhaps in order to focus or to function. We can also inherit closed doors. Traumas can be inherited by being made inaccessible. All that happened that was too hard, too painful to share or to reveal. Decolonial feminist work, black feminist work, feminist of color work is often about opening these doors, the door to what came before, colonial as well as patriarchal legacies, harassment as the hardening of that history, a history of who gets to do what, of who is deemed entitled to what, of who is deemed entitled to whom. A complaint can be necessary, what you have to do to go on, but you still have to work out what you can take on. And she went on by taking them on. I took everything off my door, my posters, my activism, my pamphlets. I smudged everything all around the building. I knew I was going to war. I did a war ritual in our tradition. I pulled down the curtain, I pulled on a mask, my people, we have a mask and I never opened my door for a year. I just let it be a crack. And only my students could come in. I would not let a single person come into my office who I had not already invited there for a whole year. Closing a door can sometimes be a survival strategy. She closes the door to the institution by withdrawing herself and her commitments from it. She still does her work. She still teaches her students. She uses the door to shut out what she can and who she can. She takes herself off the door. She depersonalizes it. And she pulls down the blinds and she pulls on a mask, the mask of her people, connecting her fight to the battles that came before. Because quite frankly, for her, this is a war. Our battles are not the same battles, but there are many battles happening behind closed doors. Behind closed doors, that is where complaints are found. So that is where you might find us too, those of us for whom the institution was not built and what we bring with us, who we bring with us, the world that would not be here if some of us were not here, the data we hold, our bodies, our memories, perhaps the more we have to spill, the tighter their hold, the more we have to spill. So many complaints end up in filing cabinets. One student of colour described of her complaint, I feel like my complaint has gone into the complaint graveyard. Yes, a filing cabinet can be a grave. When a complaint is buried, those who complain can end up feeling that they too have been buried. So sometimes to get the complaints out, all those materials, all those letters, we get out. When I made the reasons for my own resignation public, I shared information, not very much, but enough that there had even been inquiries. And I became a leak, drip, drip. The university responded in the mode of damage limitation, treating the information I shared as a mess. What mess? <laughs> but there is hope here. 
because they cannot mop up all of that mess. A leak can be a lead. By becoming a leak, I had become easier to find and people came to me with their complaints. That we find each other through complaint is a finding. Posting that letter was how I became part of a collective, a complaint collective. We are assembled before you. So even when complaints lead us to leave, we leave something of ourselves behind by complaining. A postgraduate student made an informal complaint about white supremacy in her classroom. We've heard from her. We heard how her complaint was contained in that very classroom. But she also said something else. Toward the end of her testimony, she said that an unexpected little gift was how other students could come to her. They know you are out there and they can reach out to you. She used that expression twice, an unexpected little gift. A complaint in taking you back can point forward to those who come after, who can receive something from you because of what you try to do, even though you did not get through, even though all you seem to do was scratch the surface. Yes, those scratches, we are back to those scratches. They seemed at first to show the limits of what we could accomplish, but they can also be what we leave behind. Complaint as testimony. Complaint as how we scratch our letters onto the wall. To hear complaint is to hear the sound of that labor scratching on the wall. I can't hear it, but it's happening. Knocking on the door. Knocking on the door. I hear Audrey Lord knocking on the door, telling us something's up. In an interview with Adrian Rich, Lord describes her fascination with the poem, The Listener, a poem about a traveler who rides a horse up to the door of an apparently empty house. Lord describes the poem. He knocks at the door, nobody answers. Is there anybody there, he said. And he has a feeling that there really is somebody in there. And then he turns his horse and he says, tell them I came and nobody answered, that I kept my word. I used to recite that poem to myself all the time. It was one of my favorites. And if you'd asked me, what is it about? I don't think I could have told you, but this was the first cause of my own writing. My need to say things I couldn't say otherwise when I couldn't find other poems to serve. It's important to follow Lord, to go where she goes. When we are fascinated by something, we do not always know why. What causes us to write, to express ourselves, does not always have the crispness or the edges of an about. Lord keeps reciting the poem. She also says it imprinted on her. I think of that imprint, the print of a poem on a person. Knocking on the door can be the sound of an imprint. The point is not in the answer, whether somebody answers, but in the knock. The knock is the action. You might be knocking on the door of consciousness. Remember that door can be an inheritance. Try to hear something, somebody, to admit what has been shut out, the violence passed down that has been made inaccessible. Or you might be knocking at the door of the master's house because you know that house is haunted. Knocking is hard. Knocking is how we learn that the doors of consciousness that shut violence out can be the same doors used by institutions to shut violence in. How the data of complaint, our data, our truths, ends up under lock and key. To knock on that door, to make that sound, not knock, knock who is there, but knock, knock we are here, is to cause a disturbance, to disturb the spirits who linger there because of the violence that has not been dealt with. Not not rattle, rattle. I hear Ailey Morton Robinson, who describes indigenous sovereignty as continuing in the presence of indigenous people and their land, haunting the house that Jack built, shaking its foundations, rattling the picket fence. Not not rattle, rattle. That rattling, the refusal of indigenous people to disappear can shake the foundations. There cannot not be ghosts in these stories, ghosts, graveyards, hauntings, because we are dealing with what has not been dealt with. Perhaps we are the ghosts, brown and black people in white institutions, indigenous people in settler colonial institutions. If we are the ghosts, we too are haunted by them, by what is not gone, by what goes on. 
universities are occupied by colonial and patriarchal histories, the walls and the doors, if they could talk, that is what they will be telling us, manifest as attitude, who is higher or lower, more or less, manifest in materials in who does what. Workloads are history lessons. Remember the words of the Black British woman, academic, she had to be the boss and I had to be the servant type of thing. To complain can be to refuse to serve up that history to be of service to it, she also describes. In order to survive in a hostile environment like that, a toxic one where you are more than marginal. You have to do this work of institutional analysis all the time. They are going to do this and I have to do that. And then I do this and they do that. You know what I mean? It's constant, this watchfulness that you have to have in order to protect yourself from being rarely knocked. You knock on the door, you can be knocked by the door. That work, watching out, being watchful on your toes, what's next, what comes next, protecting yourself from being rarely not. That is the work of institutional analysis, the work of complaint, the work of survival. To protect yourself is not to protect yourself from what you know. To protect yourself is to protect yourself because of what you know. I think back to that scratching. A complaint is scratching away. How we communicate over time by what we leave behind. Scratching is also learning. We know about old blocks from chipping away at the foundations. We know a chip off the old block is on its way to becoming another old block. We know that if we chip away at the old block, they'll keep finding those chips right on our shoulders. And it might seem that we are the ones who are worn, worn out and worn down by the work. We are the ones worn, worn out and worn down by the work. But not only, think of this, the more we question an inheritance, the more they have to justify an inheritance, institutional fatalism, history as inheritance, reader, I inherited him. And you know what? We know what. Justifications can become tired. Arguments can stop working. So if it seems like you're just scratching on the surface, if it seems like your complaint just ended up in that graveyard, remember this. You cannot always witness the weakening of structures until they begin to collapse. Complaints can participate in the weakening of structures without that impact being tangible. When structures begin to collapse, the impact of past efforts becomes tangible. The complaints in the graveyard can come back to haunt institutions. We can come back to haunt institutions. It's a promise. Thank you very much. We're now going to have a discussion with Sarah about her latest project and draw out some of the issues raised in today's talk, thinking about how these might relate to our own local context in Ireland. And we'll invite questions from our audience panel, who sh you should be able to see on screen. Um, but first, I'd like to begin by asking Sarah a few questions. Um, it seems that a lot of the issues undermining complaints in terms of racial discrimination go back to the imperial histories intrinsic to the logics of our social structures and their contemporary formulation. Mahmoud Mandani says the primary ideological work of neocolonialism involves a shift in language from that of exclusion to one of inclusion with the aim of managing and reproducing difference. Have you found the same issues arising from your research that in terms of institutional complaints, there is a compulsion to manage difference, which is central to the way that that complaint is then processed? That's a really good question. And I was really struck during this research over the last a few years, how, how, how similar the issues were to the early project I did on diversity work, where I was talking primarily to administrators, to equal opportunities practitioners. And um, I think it was quite striking to me because you would think that complaint would lead you in a very different direction. But many of the stories that were being shared with me by people who are trying to make complaints has a lot of resonance with what had been shared with me before. 
And one of the um, significant uh, repetitions was the way in which, I guess, universities use solutions. So diversity is often presented as a solution to a problem. I think one example from my earlier project was, was when a uh, university found that people outside the university perceived it as white and old fashioned, which is not surprising because it was white and old fashioned. But their response to that was, okay, we need a new brochure. So rather than changing the whiteness of the organization, they changed the, changed the whiteness of the image. So that management of difference actually is about how the racism that was part of the perception of the institution is also made or rendered out of sight. And I think, you know, when we think about how complaints get managed, there are, there are similar sort of mechanisms at stake. And a lot of the institutional work around complaints is focusing on procedures like we need new procedures or better procedures, as if the procedures themselves will be the solution to the kinds of problems that complaints are about bringing to the surface. And you can introduce a new procedure without it doing anything, but it's used as evidence of having done something. And I think that's where you really get, you know, the, the kind of, the, the, the desire to bring uh, these histories of racism that are about a colonial history lived ongoing in not only how the institution imagines itself, but who is doing what. Um, you, all of these sort of histories that are at stake often in a complaint about what happens to a person they're bringing to the institution, those histories tend to be managed out of existence by the kinds of solutions that are offered, the kinds of ways in which the complaint itself is handled. So I think there's a lot of, I think that the idea of, of, of managing and reproducing difference, I think it's, it's a lot of resonance with the, with, with the current project that I'm doing on complaint as well as the earlier one, yeah. Thanks. Um, <laughs> and you also discuss, uh, I mentioned um, your work on container technology as, an, as a means of rendering the other as object. Could you talk a little about how that applies to your work on complaint and whether your findings have revealed mechanisms whereby the complainant might subvert that technology, might find a way to, they, they, they're, you speak often of the way that they are physically violated, mentally violated, physically blocked, um, rendered objects. Is there a way to subvert that? I, mean, I think there are, I've been, I, 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 in listening to a lot of people tell, telling me, sharing with me stories that are actually quite traumatic. Um, it was, it, I was really aware that in, in these stories was also a great deal of creativity and innovation and, and strategizing. That obviously one of the hardest things methodologically when you're doing a project like this is that you're asking people to repeat stories that are traumatic, where the trauma is actually in the necessity of telling the story. And I think one of the things that's that, that that's part of, of going through a complaint process is you have to keep telling the story. So the complainer often is actually very expressive. To make a complaint is a requirement to be expressive. But that expression tends to get channeled and narrowed. You can only express yourself in a certain kind of way. And it's, so, so it's not so much that you become the object that doesn't speak, but that your speech is, is, is narrowed in such a way that what you say becomes unrecognizable to your own self. It becomes, in a way, institutionalized. Like I can think of one person who was a neurodiverse academic and she was telling her story to an occupational health physician who was typing it up. And then when he, he asked her to sign what he had written, but what he had written was not what she said. And she said, no. And she had to resist his retelling of the story. And I think that is a very um, tangible instance of what happens all along, that you have to express something, but that for it to be taken up, it gets narrowed and that's taken away from you. And to subvert that often requires a real um, a, a refusal of the authority of the institution. And then very quickly, the complainer becomes pathologized. In fact, the physician basically said to her something like, if, if, if you're well enough to, to do this, then you're, then you're not unwell, you, 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 your complaint is invalid. And so the, the, the doubt, the chipping away at the testimony is part of what makes the experience of trying to address something traumatic so traumatic. Um, and, and I'm trying to really, yes, yeah, so there, there, are, there are subversions possible to those dynamics and mostly that comes, yes, from refusing what the institution gives back to you. But I think mostly it really comes from working with other people, other people who go through a similar process and feel themselves alienated from their own uh, testimonies, their own words. You begin to work together as a kind of collective. And that's how you end up 
refusing the channeling and narrowing of your complaint into something that is palatable to the institution. But saying no to an institution is a very difficult thing to do on your own. So you do need a collective with you. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to give the floor to Dr. Philomena Mullen. Um, and uh, just to, to uh, give a little context, I know um, Sophie already did, but her work on institutionalization and racialization centers on the position of black mixed race survivors of the Irish industrial school system and their position within conceptualizations of Irishness. So Dr. Mullen, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sally. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for your, your talk. It was a really, really interesting. And it, it seemed to open so many doors for me, myself, you know, thinking about what you were saying and using that imagery and metaphor. Um, and I suppose in my own work, I've looked at a different institution, not the academic institutions, but a, a, an institution of care for children and kind of institutions that have betrayed children. Um, and I think over the last 20 years in Ireland, what we've seen is that a series of doors have been opened through a whole lot of reports that have come out um, on the abuse of children, sexual, physical, emotional abuse. Um, and I suppose I, I was really fascinated listening to you how those doors have had to be basically ripped off the hinges you know, to for people to get a hearing and also what you just said there in terms of the having to have a collective, you know, to make a complaint. And I'm thinking in terms of the the recent report, I don't know if you know it, the mother and baby report, um, which is a report that's come out in Ireland about the the treatment of children in Ireland um, who were born into mother and baby homes and how the testimony or the complaint of the both the mothers who would have had their children and also of the children who would have gone through the system has been heard as complaint. And how over the 20 years that complaint that was, was almost vilified and the, the testimonies of people who came forward 20 years ago, there seems to have been an arc in how that testimony has been resisted you know, by by the, the by the nation, I guess, and and that the arc seems to be shifting. Do you do you think that complaint balances itself eventually? Um, I suppose my my question would be to you, kind of like the the arcs that we see in terms of complaint. You know that that move from has moved from this vigorous rejection and a kind of a tedious criticism to a greater degree of allowing the institutional narrative to be challenged. Do you think they're blips or do you think they reflect a regrouping on the part of those who defend institutions? Well, that's a really, it's a really, really good question. And I think what's, I, I listened to the talk you gave for Emma and I, I was um, very moved by it. I think, I think you know, they, 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 there, is, there is a certain way in which the violence that is so in many of these different institutions, and that includes universities, which often think of themselves as progressive and free of violence, but are, are, are not. The violence that is in them, that people, like, people do know it's there, but they don't wanna know it's there. And we need to um, I understand that resistance to actually acknowledging that level of violence and trauma and to think about that resistance as institutional it's the resistance of the institution to recognize the violence and its own complicity in violence but it's also it also involves persons that I, I in one of the testimonies that I had for my my project there was a, a professor talked about the closed blinds that blinds come down because because people could actually see the violence but they didn't want to see the violence so I do think there's a certain point where it's almost like the, the there's so much work, the testimony has done so much work, there's so many people who have come forward that there's almost like there's no longer an ability to, 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 to resist that successfully, to get away with it, if you like. And, and there is a kind of feeling of a, of a breakthrough or something getting through. Um, and we can think of all the huge amount of work that involves some people testifying to these very traumatic histories that all of that, that work is 
necessary, the whole political movement is necessary to open those doors. But a whole political movement is also necessary to survive the consequences of those doors being opened. And I think a lot of us would know that you know, even when you have those moments, when something gets through, the violence that has been held back and not recognised comes out, even then you can still feel that there's an attempt to recontain, to, to, to stop it from stop it getting everywhere, to, to, to contain the testimonies and the people, because actually to really deal with it would be to reckon, have to force a kind of really a national conversation about, about complicity. So I think the temporality of that, the rhythm of that, the kind of opening and then closing down, and opening and closing down is, is, is recognisable to anyone who's involved in doing justice work where the justice is actually also about dealing with these very traumatic histories. So I, I think it's a really, really good question around, around, around the temporality of it, and, but, but also to sort of remember, remember the people who have to do that work, how vulnerable you have to be to bring your story, your story, that experience to a forum in order for it to be heard. The injustice of the necessity of that action is part of, of, of the story as well. Well, that's really interesting. I know that um, in my own research, I interviewed a lot of survivors and their, 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 their desire not to complain was really interesting. And I just wonder in terms of people who do survive and, and talking about closing those doors on trauma, yeah. you know, is it harder to complain? And I think of myself personally, never wanting to complain, not wanting to be seen as a complainer, you know, and I even would take it back to the academic institutions, I know that when I was in university as an undergrad, one of my lecturers asked me at the end of a year, was I going back to Bongo Bongo land? And I never complained. It never occurred to me to complain. I had heard this kind of language so often that I didn't even know there was a complaint in it. Yeah. And I just wonder at some point where we normalize stuff and, and people who don't complain you know, how, how, do, how do people deal with that? Or how do you unleash the, the ability to complain in people? Because even looking at your work where people are so traumatized by the complaint that not complaining seems easier, you know, but how do we get people to feel confident or, you know, supported to complain or even to recognize that there's a complaint there? Yeah. And this is such a really, really important set of questions. And, you know, one of the things that's very important for me to say is that I don't, what, what I'm doing is listening to people who come, have come to me with stories of complaint. And what I'm not trying to do is, is sort of suggest in any way that complaining is morally necessary or even politically necessary, that someone should be obliged to complain. Because I think for many of us, we have to find different ways of surviving these violent histories and sometimes not complaining. And one, I remember one academic talked talk to me about how she wanted us to keep her head down, keep low, you know, she'd been targeted. She didn't want to do anything that would make herself appear more mm. than she already did. And um, so she found other way. And, and even the story that I shared by the indigenous feminist of closing the door to the institution, there, there are different strategies people use and not all complaints are necessarily expressed in the way that that, that might be loud, <laughs> that might take a form we recognize as complaining. I mean, I think there's also a way in which uh, quite a lot of people I spoke to didn't complain about experiences when they had them. They actually talked to me about not complaining. That a lot of my material is about what it feels like not to complain about something. And I, I've had some just incredible stories that I, this was a known quantity. This is what I was used to. This is what I expected. This is how it was. This is what it was like. All those reasons were just there in the background and you just didn't you just didn't think that you had any right or entitlement to complain um some people talked about uh the fact that the they, they they complained and didn't get anywhere but that they're still glad they complained because if they hadn't complained they would have felt more crushed so for some people complaining was a way of saying no to a violence that would otherwise have been too much. So people have very different ways, I'm trying to say, I suppose, to respond to these really undoing violent histories. And we need to be very careful not to moralize one response as the only response. But I do think there are, there are ways in which we need to make it possible to complain 
if that is what you feel you need to do in order to challenge and oppose a, a violence that is learned and made and institutionalized. It's not natural, it's not inevitable. It, it can be challenged and, and, and that is at one level, it is does require better procedures, better reporting, more support for report, reporting and so on and so forth. But it does require, so you, you, you implied ways of thinking about collectives, ways of thinking about what it, what it actually means to support someone in enabling them to challenge the violence that makes it so difficult to be in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Dr. John Wilkins, if you'd like to step forward, his work interrogates Black and queer identities, literary representation, and activist movements. John, you have the floor. Sarah, thank you very, very much for your presentation. It was just amazing. You know, I really love the way that, you know, it, it you know, incorporated poetics, you know, incorporated the sound of scratching at the wall. I just, I really thought it was amazing because it's another way of uh, talking, in my opinion, and just another way of talking and, you know, uh, giving, you know, uh, disturbing the container technology that, you know, just, doesn't want us to speak and, and, you know, only wants us to speak in a particular way. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, in my, you know, in my um, research of uh, talking about Black gay male identity in the African diaspora, you know, I wanted to um, use methodology and I, you know, I'd consider using uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s um, signifying monkey, you know, uh, theory of, um, of Black literature. And so um, what's interesting about that is that um, in the preface, preface of the 25th edition, he um, informs on um, Cambridge and he says basically that, you know, he wanted to work with Wole Shoyenka and, but uh, uh, Clare College decided that uh, African uh, literature wasn't uh, literature at all. It was more to do with anthropology or sociology and so he had to work with Shoy, you know, in the in the anthropology department. And so um, why that's important to me is because it's it's like that etching on the brick wall that you presented. It's this historical, uh, you know, it's this historicity of the complaint collective that's still there, you know, that we still can, you know, reach back and we can touch. But it also um, kind of shines a light on the present, you know, for example, here in Ireland, we're trying to um, uh, get universities to, you know, recognize black studies and to actually teach it, you know, and so it's this idea that, um, you know, we're wanting to be uh, those that are spoken to I've spoken to or spoken with and not spoken to. And so, um, yeah, you know, I just think that, um, I guess my question to you then would be, um, this complaint collective, you know, how far back do you see it going? I mean, do you see that we, uh, we can find strategies by looking backward as well as to the present, the way that you do? Absolutely, I mean, I think, um... In a way, one of the reasons I, I use a sort of scratches on the wall, that, that actual wall incidentally belongs to a school and it's the scratching of the kids' names into the wall. Um, I got someone to take the photograph for me. And I, I think one of, the, one of the things that's really interest, interests me is forms of communication over time, how, how complaint can be a way of communicating over time. Um, and it's not always necessarily a book that you pass down. You might read a book in which there's story, there's a story, an anecdote about what happened at Cambridge. So there, there might be a trace of a previous battle that really mattered to somebody, affected what they could do and where they could go. So there's, there, there, there's, a, there's a telling of a story. But there are also lots of other battles that aren't necessarily written down in books. And it is, it is actually my firm belief that those battles, that, 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 that they are had, leave traces. They might leave traces in, uh, in gossip and rumour and, and shared memory work. People might, you know, allude to something that happened. Did you know? Did you hear? Historically in a department. Um, I, I think that there, one way or another, I think when I think about complaints or just saying no or calling out a kind of relation of exclusion or violence, I think um, it's a very outward facing action. It can be very outward facing action. It can involve people. You can, you can even say, oh, did you hear that X or did you see that Y, see that y to somebody? And every time you articulate uh, the beginning of a complaint, it, it, has a, it acquires a publicity that it wouldn't 
the choir if you kept it to yourself. So in a way, what I'm implying is that partly the communication over time comes because we don't keep these things to ourselves. We do, we do tell the story of what it's like and what it feels like to become the matter out of place in an institution. Um, and, and, and that becomes part of the institution in one way or another. And I, I, although this timeline is a narrower one than what, when, what, what we can think of much longer timelines like centuries, um, quite a number of people that I spoke to actually talked about like rece receiving letters like one person who made a complaint about bullying and harassment from their mentors, so a, po a postdoc, um, got a secret letter from somebody who had left the institution like 20 years earlier, who had tried to make a complaint and hadn't got anywhere, because that person had found out that, that this person now was making a complaint. So there was this letter being sent because, you know, when a complaint is made in the present, it can actually, it can actually release information from the past. And I, and I think that's something really, really hopeful about it, like that the, the lids can explode yet. And I think, um, I think it's a way of thinking about collectives over time. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's lots of ways we can leave traces of ourselves and of our struggles. Yeah, uh, I, think it's, I think that you're absolutely right. You know, I think that we do leave traces of ourselves. And, you know, this story of, I mean, this idea of historicity, you know, even um, from, from slave narratives and, you know, how we think of uh, queer identities, you know, in those spaces, but moving forward, you know, um, um, how we teach those, how we teach those narratives in, um, in academia and who's allowed to teach those stories, you know, how those stories come, you know, uh, get uh, exhibited, you know, on, on a bigger stage. Um, I, I think that, you know, personally in my work, what I like to do is I like to use novels that are, um, you know, poorly researched or underrepresented, you know, in the academy. And um, so that, that, you know, I can then bring out um, and talk about queer identities and black identities and how they intersect, you know, what those intersections are. But, you know, um, I don't know, I don't know how you find it, but I find that, you know, um, this kind of, um, this kind of positioning is, it's very difficult. And, you know, the, the complaint collective is very important then. But um, I guess once again, you know, I'd like to talk to you, I want you, would like to ask you about, you know, um, how do you see world dismantling, um, strategies, you know, in terms of like creating anthologies for like, I know a Soto Saint, you know, from Haiti, you know, came to America and, you know, he, uh, you know, queer man who actually produces then poetry and literature, but in, in um, anthology. And so that gives him an introduction into the academy in a particular way. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I would want you to talk a little bit more about world dismantling um, initiatives that could actually affect the academy. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I mean, one can have such a long conversation about that. And I mean, I, I, um, I think there's a way in which a lot of the, the projects that I care about, including actually cultural studies in the, in the, in the British context, cultural studies as, as a kind of project of trying to rebuild the academy. It, it is about um, thinking about who isn't here or who isn't being taught and how, how is what is taught taught in a way that disembeds and disembodies the knowledge and the text from a history that matters and I mean I even remember teaching where I did where you would expect there to be a lot of race teaching or gender teaching but there wasn't particularly at least when I was there and when he was would start teaching something even something quite you know expected you might might teach like um something quite recent like you might teach to a hall or something like that and students be like oh yes yes, something that I can connect to, something that matters to me, something that's a history that makes sense of where I am and what kind of questions I want to ask. So I think bringing other histories into these spaces um, and also, I mean, it really does make a difference to people because, I mean, I, I mean, I, at one level, I'm doing this project on complaint as somebody who's not no longer at the university. So I mean, you might ask me like, why? <laughs> but I mean, it's partly because I really do believe that the university is a space in which we go to learn and unlearn habits and histories. So I think how we do that is really important. And then there is a long history of doing that. And sometimes, you know, it's really good to remember the history of other educational strategies and tactics people have used, whether it's in black studies, cultural studies, gender studies, queer studies, to actually try and, you know, remember that 
one idea of a human being or one idea of a person or one idea of a category such as sex or race or the ideas that come to be, you know, sedimented or given, these have histories and there are other ways of, of telling the story. And we can start from different different points of view. This is not very concrete. I'm not being very good at being concrete ever, but um, I, I, I think the inventiveness is already there. Like the world dismantling strategies are already there. And I think in a way we're, we're constantly fighting not to have them be appropriated and neutralized and channeled into sort of another kind of diversity game. And even something like decolonizing can easily um, become appropriated and managed to, you, to go back to um, the term that you introduced. So. Yeah, I think it'd be a great conversation to have. World dismantling strategies, bring them to the table. Let's talk about them. <laughs> and on that note, I'd like to um, invite back Papita. Let's hope you can hear me. Yay! 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 <laughs> <laughs> So, Sarah, I was saying thank you so much for um, the talk. Of course, like we love how you talk, but I think it's important to also uh, acknowledge the beautiful way you use language. The, it's almost like a lyrical, poetical quality to it. And I think it's very important because of the subject, the way you talk about it makes it speak to the heart of at least students like me in a way that is very rare. Now, when you were talking about filing cabinets and just now also when you're talking about how uh, it, can, it can be so easy to appropriate uh, these uh, structures or these efforts, I was reminded also, and I also wanted to ask you, I'm sure you would remember that there was an effort, uh, a kind of an experiment back in 2017 in India where students got together and they were so tired of the due process not working that what they did was, again, the kind of whisper networks that Sarah was talking about, they got together and they published uh, just a Google Drive document of a list of sexual harassment, uh, in sexual harasses in academia. And the kind of the first and foremost resistance to that came from a group of uh, feminists established Established feminist who said that that this was not the way to go and rather uh, students should uh, continue believing in due process even though like your work shows as well that due process is clearly not working and from various contexts so we see then feminism kind of becoming a lock that keeps the door closed if we use that to the same uh, metaphor that you've been using how do you what do you think about that how do you talk to that how I, I do not want to you know to just to make myself clear it is not, I don't I'm not discarding that that historical position as well I'm just saying how do you make these two talk to each other which doesn't benefit the institutional blindness at the end I, I think it's actually a really good way of putting it how do you how do you make this conversation happen in a way that doesn't just end up reproducing the institution you know I, I wanted to say in the first instance, like I'm with the students, <laughs> just generally speaking, I feel much <laughs> politically aligned with those who see how due process can work, you know, to use Audrey Law's terms as a master's tools, how these processes are designed to be exhausting, how they can exhaust our, our, our will and our agency, and how they end up being another way of cleaning the house, keeping the appearances up. And it's incredibly hard to get complaints through the system because the, the system is designed to stop them. It's part of the system. But I think I, I, was, I would also say that, I mean, I, I think a lot of the people that I have spoken to have, have ended up using alternative means to get their complaints out. Because even if you get your complaint through the system, when it's filed away, the point of the filing cabinet is to stop there being more public knowledge of what has been done and said. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of people, you know, politics begins with the filing cabinet. The filing cabinet is a political object par excellence. That what's in there, is temporarily housed. So that it's there really matters. Well, what that means that, that that it's there, that the materials are there, the folders, the files, is also a reflection of the fact that people often have gone through due process. They have filed the letters, they have gathered the files, they have done the work. That's why there's so much material in the filing cabinet. So in, in a way, I don't think of formal complaint as a separate sphere of action to that of direct action. We only have the materials to get out because they've already got in and they've often got in because people have actually done what they can in following the formal procedures of the, laid down by institutions, the pathways. Um, so uh, 
then I've had quite a number of students where they have either done public lists or they've produced lap pamphlets or they've written names of harassers in books to get the information out. And they were kind of like a need to be quite inventive, but that you get very disciplined. I mean, I, I got disciplined, I'll just add, add that, just for blogging on my own blog, that why I was resigning led to, be, to being disciplined, not just by the mm. institution, but by other feminists because mm. feminists too can get very invested in in the reputation of the institution and they can attach the welfare of feminism and their own welfare with the welfare of the institution in such a way that if you let out any information you're kind of a vandal so that's why i said i have sympathy with the students because i'm a co i'm a vandal too um i think i think we need to really question the desire to 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 um well i think one we need to question the faith in due process like where's the critique yes. of formal process of the law that we would ordinarily expect from feminists, one. Two, we need to wonder and worry about the feminist investment in maintaining the reputation of institutions. How does that happen? Because quite a number of, people, uh, of students, but also academics have said to me that there's a real emphasis that the silence, that you need to be, you maintain your silence, that silence is dignified, that you shouldn't air the complaint like dirty laundry is often the metaphor used. And I think we need to really question that because it, it ought to be part of the feminist job description to speak out about these forms of violence that are so often concealed by the mechanisms for dealing with them. And it, it is, as far as I'm concerned, part of the feminist job, job description. <laughs> I that think I've, I've quite answered your question. I think I've just made my allegiance as clear. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it does. And it at least it helps me because like I, I the same thoughts come, of course, come out like who is your politics for at the end of the day mm -hmm. and why why do you want to stand for a pro process that clearly isn't working for for generations after generations of students at the end but it also brings me again the filing cabinet that is not <laughs> so sorry <laughs> yes i don't know um so Irish universities, and I, uh, I love your work also because it, it shows the spaces where the post boxes, which are not used as it's supposed to be. And thinking about Irish universities, and I want to use this space also to bring up this because I know there are a lot of Irish academics right now watching us. Uh, we don't have those filing cabinets present at all in Irish universities. So there is no system of complaints, say for example, sexual harassment in the sense of, say we have the Title IX in US or we would have the uh, legally uh, mandatory committees against sexual harassment in universities in India. So what do you do then? You clearly then, you know that this, this conundrum of do you then ask or fight for a system which clearly hasn't been working elsewhere or do you, want, do you rather not go into that structure at all and try to look for an alternative path? And if yes, then, then what? How, do, the, how should Irish Academy, uh, universities deal with this? Because they haven't dealt with it at all, yeah. Yeah. you know? I, mean, I think it's a really good question. I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer this question. I, I'll tell you what I think. I mean, I, I mean, in, in, in the stories that I've collected, there is so much critique of procedure and policy. And I, I really developed some of my earlier arguments about non-performativity just from listening to people, in particular the way in which policies and procedures are suspended um, by institutions, not just at the level of the complaints process, but all over the place, at the level of hiring people, suspending procedures when you want to get the right person, when you want to get your friend into the job, for instance. And so, I mean, a lot of the effort in the British context is to develop better complaints procedures. And I'm, and I'm not against that by any means. There's a lot of things you can do. You can enable collective complaints. You can remove the kind of timeline so that you can make a complaint at any point, at any time after something has happened. They're, they're just obvious ways in which you can improve procedures. But, but we also know that procedures don't have to be followed and that often creating new procedures is... Is, is, is used as if that is changing the culture. Yes. And you can change the procedure without changing the culture. I, I know many instances where people that who talk to me, talk to me about experiences that they had in institutions where they had developed really great new policies and procedures on complaint and they had made no difference whatsoever. So that's really, really complicated. It doesn't mean that you don't need to think about formal mechanisms. It's certainly one of the things that comes back to me, particularly around sexual harassment is a lack of formality Mm. is quite a big problem not only in the, the, the not having systems to handle making complaints but also in the reproducing the harassment in the first place there's no there's no 
sort of formal structures that actually enables that kinds of harassment to become more undetected because people are bypassing the kind of culture of audit that a lot of us might dismiss as part of neoliberal bureaucratic agenda can also be a useful system for ensuring that there are ways of picking up behavior that or conduct that is actually quite questionable. So, you know, informal academic cultures might be nice, like where they're hanging out, but they can also make people very, very vulnerable. And so often actually formal procedures and formal mechanisms can be there to protect those who aren't institutionally, um, you know, protected by other means. So I think you need to do both at the same time. You need to think about the development of formal mechanisms to enable reporting and complaints to go through. You also need to think about how that in itself is not going to be justice. <laughs> justice is also going to be looking at why does this happen in the first place? What is it in academic culture that is enabling these forms of harassment and bullying to, to happen and to happen behind closed doors? And then you also need to think about support systems that, you know, support often works organically and informally. So you happen to ha have a colleague or a, a, a peer who gets it and you work together. And that, that's great. That's how, you know, a lot of our political work does happen. But that, that, that can't be enough. What if it is one person who doesn't have that person who's there and who gets it? There needs to be some degree of institutionalizing of, of, a, of a support system that is that is predicated on caring for the person and listening to the person. Um, so yeah, I think even though I said I can't imagine a conversation between the two sets of people that you're uh, evoked, you know, in a way by having a double strategy in, in the development of a set of formal mechanisms, whilst also a consciousness of the inadequacy of those mechanisms is a kind of conversation between those two sets of people. Thank thanks, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> um, thanks, Alpita. Um, I'm just conscious of the time now, and um, we've had a very lengthy discussion, so we do need to wrap, unfortunately. So I'd just like to say thank you, Sarah, for such a brilliantly broad and timely examination of complaints, for your generosity in enabling this discussion um, with our panel, and of course, to our wonderful panel for their contributions. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our audience for your questions and your insights. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them, but I hope that what we did cover was of some use and we appreciate your time and consideration. And finally, I'd just like to say thank you to Sophie for putting together this event and thank you to everyone at IMMA for facilitating such a, a critically important event.